Did a statue seek revenge on a man in ancient Greece? The internet says, I don't know. Let's find out. Maybe? Welcome to the internet says it's true, where every week we learn something that sounds like it's made up, but it's really true. Part of the WCBE podcast experience. My name is Michael Kent. Let's learn some ancient Greek stories. I'm on the road on the fall tour now, producing these episodes as I go. So I've been doing my best to keep working from airplanes and hotel rooms. I just got done doing two shows in Iowa. Those were awesome. And this week I'm in Lubbock, Texas, Reading, Pennsylvania, and Potsdam, New York, the cultural hub of the world. This is going to be a weird episode, by the way, because it deals with a lot of unprovable stuff. So please forgive the departure from our normal well-sourced stories, but I found this story and you're just going to have to trust me. I think you'll enjoy it. It's weird. It's at least partially true, if not totally true. And I really haven't done much, if anything, in ancient Greece. As you can imagine, this podcast takes a ton of work every week. And if it is important to you, or if you found yourself enjoying these weekly stories, consider becoming a part of the Patreon community, if you would. You can join at $1 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month, or whatever you feel like you can pledge. And that support is really appreciated. And finally, before we get to the story, don't forget to rate and review The Internet Says It's True on Apple Podcasts. You can do that through the app or on your computer. And if you leave a five-star rating with a couple sentences, what that does is it helps more people find the show and lets more people listen. So here's the story. We are going back to the birth of a man named Theagenes of Thasos. In the northeastern part of Greece, you've got the Thracian Sea. That's the northern part of the Aegean Sea, and it's over there where you've got Turkey just to the east. There's an island called Thasos. On that island, in about 500 BC, Theagenes was born. The name would be pronounced Theagenes, I think, in Greece, but for the purpose of this podcast, I'll be pronouncing it Theagenes. Age nine was the first time we hear stories about this guy, and we hear about him from the writings of Pausanias, the Greek traveler and geographer. The story straight from Pausanias goes like this. Here's a direct quote. Quote, Not far from the kings stands a Thacian, Theagenes, the son of Timosthenes. In his ninth year, they say, as he was going home from school, he was attracted by a bronze image of some god or other in the marketplace. So he caught up the image, placed it on one of his shoulders, and carried it home. The citizens were enraged at what he had done, but one of them, a respected man of advanced years, bade them not to kill the lad, and ordered him to carry the image from his home back again to the marketplace. This he did, and at once became famous for his strength, his feet being noised abroad throughout Greece." End quote. That story is pretty well established. The kid stole a statue and had to bring it home so they didn't kill him. Some say he stole a statue of the god Zeus, and whoever the statue depicted, it was important enough that townspeople considered executing the young boy. Pretty extreme. So this was a negative story, but it sets an early tone for this kid having unusual strength. And he would go on to become so well known for his strength that we even get these embellishments of his lineage. For example, Pausanias says, quote, The Thacians say that Timosthenes was not the father of Theagenes, but a priest of the Thasian Heracles, a phantom of whom in the likeness of Timosthenes had intercourse with the mother of Theagenes, end quote. Imagine being so strong that they're like, that dude's dad can't really be his dad. His real dad is probably Hercules. Anyway, we would have never known about the Agenes from the theft of a statue alone. It's what he did throughout his life and after his life that made him remarkable. He was a fighter for sport and was the best around. He won more than 1,400 events over 22 years. His sports were boxing, wrestling, and a thing called pancration, which apparently was just ancient Greek MMA. It actually still exists. They still compete in pancration in the world combat games and some other places. He's best known for being a winner in the original Olympics. In the 75th Olympiad in 480 BC, he had planned to compete in both boxing and pancration. In boxing, he defeated a man named Euthymos, but after the match didn't have enough energy to complete in pancration. 
so he was fined for unsportsmanlike conduct. He returned in the 76th Olympiad in 476 BC to compete in pancration and won. For the rest of his life, he was known for winning those two Olympic titles, but he also competed in numerous other games. He won three times in the Pythian Games, nine times in the Nemean Games, and ten times in the Isthmian Games. Isthmian, I-S-T-H-M-I-A-N. He became known throughout Greece as the greatest fighter and continued his career for 22 years. The number of crowns he won, 1400, is mentioned by Pausanias in his writings. Another thing that he mentioned were the many statues erected of Theagenes throughout Greece. It's the story about one of those statues that makes for an interesting and bizarre legend. We'll get into that after the break. There was a time that humans used 100% organic products as healing balms and moisturizers for their skin. Well, I've partnered with an awesome company that wants to get back to those times. Fatco sells organic and responsibly made tallow-based skincare products. For centuries, humans used tallow in skin moisturizers and healing balms, but unfortunately, the topical application of these fats seemed to stop around the same time that animal fats stopped being considered part of a healthy diet. A lot of modern skincare products do more harm than good by stripping your skin of its natural oils. Let's change that. You can try them out now at fatco.com and get 15% off your order by using my promo code INTERNET. Go to the internet says it's true.com slash deals for the link. Hey. The future of policing in Columbus is back for a look at where we go from here. With a new police chief, new civilian review board, a larger budget, and a community still looking for answers to excessive use of force and corruption in the Division of Police. Join me, your host Edie Driscoll, as I interview academic and other experts. Find us at the Podcast Experience tab at wcbe.org. Let's get back to the story. In his home city on the island of Thasos, Theagenes was immortalized with a large bronze statue. The statue was created and cast by a famous sculptor of the time, Clausius of Aegina. Now everything we know about this story is from the writings at the time, which isn't a great deal, but it's likely this story was created after Theagenes' death. And I scoured the web, I couldn't find any mention of how long he lived or how he died, or when he died. His entire legacy is wrapped up into the stories I've told about him so far, and the one I'm about to tell concerning his statue. The legend tells a story about a man who was envious of Theagenes. He was likely a former competitor who had been beaten by the man during his life. He visited the statue every night, taunting it and beating on it as if it were Theagenes himself. In a final heroic victory, the figure of the great fighter, cast in bronze, fell over onto the man, crushing him to death. It's a poetic, karmic story that just adds to the legend of the amazing athlete Theagenes. The story doesn't end there. The statue was put on trial for murder. It was apparently common for both animals and inanimate objects to be treated as people when it came to murder back in ancient Greece. At least those were the laws of Thasos. There are even records of animal being tried for crimes in England all the way up to the 18th century. Well, the family of the killed man decided that, since the statue of Theagenes had killed this man, it should be charged with his murder. The statue, of course, was found guilty, and the punishment was exile from Thasos. So the statue was tossed into the sea. But again, the story doesn't end there, because Theagenes of Thasos was determined to never be beaten. Soon after the statue was tossed into the sea, Thasos suffered a horrible drought and famine. This was unusual for Thasos. The island produced a horrible harvest, and they immediately sailed to Delphi to talk to Pythia, the oracle of Delphos. She was the high priestess and gave prophecies for Greece. The purpose of talking to her was to figure out what god or gods they had offended in order to deserve this horrible turn of luck. She said they should readmit anyone who had been exiled from Thasos, and they did, but nothing changed. They questioned the oracle again, and she told them they had forgotten to readmit the great Theagenes. Remember, even though he was long dead, they had banished his statue for killing someone, 
So they sent fishermen into the sea to try to recover the bronze statue. And they eventually, miraculously, found the statue, raised it to the boat, and put it back on the original site. This not only supposedly ended the drought, but it also raised the Agenes of Thasos to a godlike status. We really don't know what happened to the statue, but some believe that the bronze statue called Boxer at Rest is the original statue of the Agenes. If you've ever played the game Assassin's Creed Odyssey, they depict the statue of the Agenes as this Boxer at Rest statue. The date this statue was created is thought to be anywhere from 330 to 50 BC, meaning that if it is the statue of the Agenes mentioned in the story, it was created hundreds of years after his death. It was discovered in the ruins of a Roman bath in 1885, and you can visit the statue in the National Museum of Rome. So sometimes I end these episodes by saying the internet says it's true, but it's tough with this one. Stories this old are near impossible to prove. We have written accounts of the story, but it could just be that, a story. Even so, I'd like to believe it's true. Humans have done stranger things than worship statues as real people. So if you're ever in Rome and you visit the National Museum, go look at the Boxer at Rest statue and wonder, is this the ancient fighter Theagenes of Thasos? And if so, maybe don't say anything bad about it until you're out of earshot. It's time for the part of the podcast where I call a friend. Today, we are calling another magician. I joked with my friend the other day, uh, I'm going to start calling this podcast Magicians Talking About History because I've had a string of, of several magicians. And today's, de- and today's guest is no stranger to the show. He's a mind reader and a great friend of mine, Eric Diddleman. Welcome back, Eric. Thanks for having me. It's been a little while. I've been and- trying to get you for weeks, yeah. man. And been busy, but at least you'll have a mentalist talking about history now. That's right. Yeah. I, did I offend <laughs> you a minute ago when I said magicians? No, it's fine. It's good. It's all good. <laughs> you know, um, last week, Peter Bois and I talked about our most favorite and least favorite plots in magic, and all my least favorite were mentalism plots. So I don't know what that says about me or about you. <laughs> Or my relationship to you. says you haven't seen enough good mentalism. I mean, I've seen great <laughs> mentalism. It's the bad mentalism that sticks with me is the problem. That's fair. Yeah. And it's easy to do mentalism poorly, I would argue. It's, it's yeah. easy to do magic poorly as well. So that's not really... I, I, I frame it the other way. It's hard to do mentalism well. Okay. That's good. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. a positive way to say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How have you been other than extremely busy? Good. I've been just on the road a lot and I'm hitting the road again this week and just uh good and then when i'm in town i don't really have much time to relax because i'm doing shows around new york so yeah it's i mean it's very cool that you're doing shows when you're not on the road because i know that those shows in new york don't pay as well as your road shows and i i give it up to you for like still wanting to perform i mean it's a great (laughs) thing i I used to have that kind of ambition um, and I love to perform, but when I'm home, man, I'm like, I just want to be on the couch. Yeah. Having downtime is healthy. So I have to try and plan that as well. But, you know, I like being out on stage and trying things and, uh, and it, there's some really, really fun shows in town. So it's like, I'd like, even though they're not the, the, the biggest money makers per se, uh, compared to, you know, being on the road, they're still benefits to you know keeping those fires in the iron irons in the fire rather not like fires, fires in the in iron, the iron it's because like a... that that's like welding i guess <laughs> <laughs> i like it i like it man yeah well i always enjoy uh keeping up with with what you're up to and we're getting to that point where the college season is starting and it's finally really coming back after th- right. three years of not being there uh you heading anywhere fun this week um, Indiana and, uh, or K- Kentucky, or okay. uh, is it Tennessee? No, it's, Me- it's Tennessee. <laughs> those, those are three different Tennessee. things. <laughs> I'll give, See, uh, this is how tired I am. You said Memphis <laughs> and I will give you Memphis is on a border of like three states. So I understand. Exactly. The there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Long Island, uh, just all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. And a couple public shows coming up too, which I'm excited about just wow. to know. Yeah, you know, Mohegan Sun up in Connecticut. You can catch me there. You're and, doing uh, casinos now. 
Yeah, or comedy clubs in casinos. That still counts. counts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have to go to Iowa this week. So Ooh, that's, that's where fun. I'm starting out the the tour. Yeah, it's a place I've been to before, so happy to to go back. I'm doing two shows Friday night. Uh, nice. And then I have like three days, four days off. So, uh, yeah, man. Well, let's get into the, the quiz this week. When I asked okay. you to come on, you said it's not a depressing topic, is, topic, is <laughs> it? Because it's always hard when there's some depressing topic and then we got to get into to jokey jokes. But uh, this yeah. one is not depressing. And for this first question, we're going to play for a joke. So if you get it wrong, you have to tell me a joke. If you get it right, I'll tell you one. Okay. Here is your question. Theagenes of Thesos was a Greek hero from 2,700 years ago. He was an incredible boxer and wrestler. Which one of these legends about Theagenes of Thasos is true? Oh, everyone knows Theagenes of Thasos. This is easy. And I'm not even guaranteeing that I'm saying it right. (laughs) (laughs) A, he turned into a goldfish, and to this day, Greek people believe that the spirit of Thasos, of Theagenes of Thasos, is alive in all goldfish. B, he declared himself ruler of all earth, and for his whole lifetime, all of Greece agreed. Or C, he continued his domination over opponents in the form of a statue erected to his memory when it fell on a man who was taunting it. Oh, the goldfish one seems so weird. I, like, it's almost so left field I want to choose it, but I'm not going to... Uh, what the the ruler of the world sounds great, and then there's also the statue. I feel like I know my Greek history a little bit, but I've never heard this, so this is just a shot of the dark. Um, I want to say, I don't know, just because it sounds fun. Ruler of the world. The answer, Eric, is the statue. He really <laughs> there was a statue erected to this guy. So first of all, he was like undefeated for 22 years as a boxer and Mm -hmm. wrestler and pancreationist pancreation is like mma in ancient greece okay so he did all these things he was amazing he won olympic titles in the original olympic games and all these different things and then there was a guy who was taunting his statue and then the statue fell on him and killed him and does that remind you of any modern story i haven't talked about this in the podcast yet but there is a modern parallel to this concept of a statue Uh, falling and killing someone Vaguely sounds familiar. So if you've ever driven toward the Denver airport, there is oh, the, a I know gi- what it is. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's it's a the horse giant statue. blue Bronco, a giant horse that is, um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff about the Denver airport that's just weird, but this statue is particularly weird and it's giant. And as it was uh, being built, it fell on the guy who built it and killed him. That's why they think it's cursed and there's all these conspiracies in the Denver airport. Well, there's one. That's one reason why they think it cursed. The other is because it has red glowing eyes. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's like demonic. most horses do. Yeah. I mean, this <laughs> I, I have I, I, I'd like to say I've been around horses a fair amount in my life and have yet to see one with red glowing eyes or a blue one. Um, so, oh, right. Yeah. yeah. But it is common for horses to trample people. Right. Not when they're statuized, though. No. And the other interesting thing about the statue was after it killed the guy as a punishment, they they punished the statue by throwing it into the sea. Uh, And and then like all the the Greek statue. Yeah, the Greek statue, not the horse. The horse is still there to this day. Uh, And so when they threw it into the sea, a bunch of bad stuff happened in Greece and they blamed like the leader of Greece blamed the statue and they went and dug it out of the sea. And it's, wow. they have it to this day. The statue exists. It's like in a museum. So that's cool. Yeah. Just a very weird story. Um, this was a really strange one this week because it's another thing like it was 27 he- years ago, uh, 2,700 years ago. I can't really, I can't really prove like the internet might say it's true, but you know, you're trusting right. a guy who wrote it in a book that wrote it because <laughs> he heard it in a story and you know how those things. Well, go. I wonder if it was one of those statues because I know they used to be um they used to paint statues. Like, well, that was going to the- be one of my trivia questions this week and I decided not to include it. So I'm glad I didn't because you knew it. Uh <laughs> yeah, the statues Roman and Greek statues were not like marble white like we see them today. They were painted, which would have looked incredibly tacky by our standards, but that's only because uh yeah. the way that we just have displayed statues in museums for all these years. Right. So I'm just picturing this wrestler dude, 
all decked out in like WWE <laughs> like colors. <a> <laughs> he's got his, he's got, he's got like face Painted paint. Belt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ultimate warrior Ultimate style. Ultimate warrior face paint. Oh man. Uh, do you have a, do you have a joke book joke or a fun joke? I have a joke. I don't know if I've said it on this podcast before forget, or not. So. It's okay. All right. What's brown and sticky? What? A stick. Boo. <laughs> you like that one. I know. On. I know. Let's, I'll read a joke here. Just to make up for that one. Uh, here's one. Knock, knock. Who's there? Sam and Janet. Sam and Janet who? Sam and Janet evening. Okay, that's way worse than mine. <laughs> Dixon's joke treasury, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let's move on for this question. Question two. We're playing for a silly audio Easter egg in the next podcast. So if you get it wrong... You'll have to say a phrase of my choosing on your podcast, which is the Mind Over Magic podcast with magician Matt Franco. If you get it right, I'll say it on the next episode of this show. The phrase this time is, quote, Star Wars is really just a 1970s telling of Snow White when you break it down. Oh, I don't, I gotta get this right. I don't think I Star can Wars justify is, saying that. Oh, no, you don't. That's the whole point is that you can't justify this. Star Wars is really just a 1970s telling of Snow White when you break it down. Okay. Uh, and I would be happy with a paraphrasing of that as well. Yeah. Here's your question. Before the invention of toilet paper, how did the ancient Greeks clean up after a number two? Was it A, they used a rock? B, they used their hand, or C, they didn't. Oh, boy. I don't like any of these. <laughs> <laughs> this all seems wrong. Um, oh, boy. I don't know my Greek history as well as I thought. Well, they don't teach how they pooped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, were they also painting that in colors? Or... <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to think. Um, hmm. I want to say maybe my instinct is like may I think like baths were like a big thing like public bat like baths uh to hang out so I don't think they and I'm sure they got gross just from bathing in them too so I feel like they didn't that's my answer they C. didn't the answer is a they used a rock no yes, i don't like did. it they used flat terracotta discs or stones called pesoi p-e-s-s-o-i and these have been discovered next to ancient latrines in both greek and roman ruins who knew what so i have to say star wars is a retelling it's of just the a 19 19th. it's it's just a 1970s telling of snow white when you break it down Oh boy! So why do you, I agree to be on your podcast? So I so <laughs> first of all, I'm guessing that Matt Franco has never seen Star Wars. I think we made him watch. I like okay. at one point. I don't know if he got through the, all three. <laughs> so if you can t if you can bring it up to talk about Star Wars with Matt, um, and and his recent, I, I so when you when you made Matt watch Star Wars for the first time as a tw twenty something thirty something. What yeah. does it hold up when it's not when it doesn't have nostalgia behind it? Is it a thing that an adult can watch in 2022? Um, I don't know if Matt's the best basis for that question, but he's just not uh, big on like pop culture films and stuff in general. I just don't that, think I hate talking yeah. about him when he's not here, but right. I'll let him answer. I, I mean, we have episodes in our past where he talked about his feelings on go, it. I don't know go if back, he, he listen was to the back in. catalog of, yeah, of yeah, yeah. Mind Over Magic. They talk about a lot of stuff that has neither, nothing to do with magic or minds. So, yeah, um, you know, it's, it's about performance and how things can relate to showbiz and, uh, and knowing a little bit about Star Wars, I think, can help. <laughs> well, and Snow White. And Snow White. You're uh, over too. For this question, we're oh. going to play for a Tell Me What to Google sticker. These are left over from what this podcast used to be called. I think you were a guest on Tell Me What to Google before I rebranded. Um, you know I don't like getting questions wrong. So I this know. Is really Ace, yeah, you're a big trivia guy, and these are really hard this week. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> But, I mean, like, who knows who, you know, no one would know any of this stuff. Our story this week takes place on the island of Thasos in Greece, or Thassos, uh, Thassos, I don't know. It's also the home of the ancient Greek, Greek hegemon, who invented what? H-E-G-E-M-O-N invented what? A, democracy, B, parody, or C, 
yogurt. Mm. Now, if these were like Greek myth questions, I feel like that's a category <laughs> I could do. Yeah, this I've is like never... actual real. Well, you know, it's history as much as we know it. Um, I don't I don't think it's democracy. If not, we'd be blaming this guy all the time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Damn hegemon. Uh, yeah. Um, yogurt. And what was the other one? Uh, parody. Parody. Parody sounds like it could be a thing. But and I'm I talking like... about parody, P-A-R-O-D-Y, not P-A-R-I-T-Y. Parody, yeah, P-A-R-O-D-Y. not like yeah. between two things. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like mocking, a, a, like a yeah. jest of a some type sort of, of comedy. Form. Yeah. A type of comedy. That seems more like in line with the Greek traditions of theater. Um, but then yogurt. I don't know. Can you invent yogurt? I guess you can. I'm going to go parody is my guess. The answer is parody you got one Yay. you're one for three you get a sticker uh, you owe me like 20 of these stickers now <laughs> i really do <laughs> and i don't have any like i have the tell me what to google ones but i still i keep saying i'm going to reorder the the new ones and i just haven't done it i do have t-shirts and mugs now though oh wow uh, which is there exciting so uh anyway yeah how many stickers can i trade in for a t-shirt oh that's a good is it, I, is it like a carnival game <laughs> It's it's the same as the extra, exchange rate of Shroot Bucks to Stanley Nichols, uh, whatever that whatever that is. Yeah. Uh, so this guy Hegemon or Hegemon, whatever, he was a Greek writer of the old comedy. Hardly anything is known of him except that he flourished during the Peloponnesian War. And according to Aristotle, he was the inventor of a kind of parody by slightly altering the wording in well-known poems. He transformed the sublime into the ridiculous. Um, like and that. democracy was invented in Greece, but not by any one person. Right. That's what I, I figured that. So, yeah. And I was reading about democracy and, and the very beginning of democracy. And it seems like lately they think that it predates like organized Greek culture and it has more to do with smaller tribes. Um, you know, like it was democracy was a thing in, within smaller tribes before, you know, the, the rising of the Greek culture, society, <laughs> civilization. If it was invented by one person, it kind of defeats the purpose of <laughs> yeah, that's democracy. That's not what democracy is. <laughs> <laughs> I invented democracy and I can take it away. <laughs> that's hilarious. Uh, all right. So you'll, <clears throat> you'll get a sticker. Question four. Mm. Moving right along. By the way, I got to ask you about what what's what's the deal with this magazine? You are on the cover this month of Mum Magazine. Or is it M-U-M? How do they say it? Because there are periods. I believe it's M U M. Yeah, M-U-M it's magazine. Um, the magazine, the trade magazine for the Society of American Magicians, which you should know who the founder of that organization is. I'm not a member, but the but it's a famous member. Uh, is Her this fa- member is this member living? No. Oh, here I'm quizzing the quiz master. Oh, so so, uh, so if you get this it's, wrong, it's Harry you Houdini. also. <laughs> Yes, you okay. did get it right. It is Harry Houdini. Okay. Uh, I get a so sticker. You, you get a sticker, <laughs> your own sticker. I don't have to give it to you. Uh, but he was, uh, yeah, he founded the Society of American Magicians. And uh, this month I happen to be on the cover of that magazine. Uh, so if you're not a magician and not a member, you probably can't read it. Except I did take out the just the article part so that secrets aren't revealed in the rest of the magazine. Right, right. And you can actually read it on our Patreon for our podcast at patreon.com slash mindovermagicpodcast. I hope no one at MUM is listening to that because I feel like that is not... Uh, I mean, I did keep the other the (laughs) other part of the article that had some secrets in it. That's that's behind a paywall. That's awesome. Um, So, yeah, you can listen or you can read that. And and honestly, it would be pretty cool for someone who's not a magician to sort of pull back the curtain and be able to read an article in uh, a trade publication that is pretty highly guarded. Uh, Not anyone can get can get that magazine. I've had two articles in in MUM. um, Nice. But both, you know, where someone else, I think, like. um, uh, Christian had a Christian enough. Christian and Catalina had a used to have a have a column, and he would he asked me, and then someone else had a column, and they asked me to contribute. So, uh, nice. but I'm not a I've never been an SAM member. I've I've I was an IBM member for years, mm. and now I'm neither. Nor am I. But I'm on the cover. <laughs> and you know why I'm not a member of either one of those? Because uh, uh, Netflix, Disney Plus, Hulu. All my other, like I would rather spend that money on those types of bills 
than a go. magazine that I'm not going to read. I never read the the magazine that came with the IBM thing. You know, uh, magic yeah. magazines in general are just they're great when I'm on vacation. Other than that, I never read them. Yeah, so. that looks like the st- the stack of books by my bed right now. <laughs> I feel like yeah. I'm not reading my big reading list. <laughs> yeah, I just don't I don't uh, make time to read. I shouldn't say I don't have time because I do have time, but I, I don't make time. And I was thinking about this recently because I want to keep this podcast going on this fall tour just to feel what that feels like to be able to yeah. create on the road. And I decided like I won't be reading on the plane. I won't be playing games on my phone. I'll be writing. And I really writing. want to do that. Like I want to push myself to to keep these going. And you, the audience, will be able to know very quickly whether or not I keep that promise uh, next week because uh, you're on the road. I'm, I'm on the road and we'll see. We'll see what happens. Are you bringing like recording equipment with you on the road? I and- am. I am. Nice. So I, I don't know if the people listening are, are nerdy enough to like care about the audio production of I've been through three or four iterations of what I will consider my mobile recording studio. Mm. And the latest is just recording straight into my digital, my Tascam DR40 recorder um, with a with a shotgun microphone. Nice. Um, and so and I, I talked to some voiceover artists who do auditions from the road from hotel rooms and shotgun seems to be the most sound isolating, you know, like it, it's it's so hyper directional that uh, you put, a, you know, put a couple pillows behind you and in front of you and keep some of that bounce away. And and I've done uh, one episode with you. If you, you all listen to the um, the episode where we talked about the dialect that was with my mobile studio. So. There it does. Go. It does. OK. It does. OK. Anywho, um, I'm hoping to not have to record too many on the road, but at least writing, you know, I can do that. Mm, exactly. So cool. If, uh, let's see. You're you're one for three. And for this fourth question, we're going to play for an admission of our favorite and least favorite plot in magic. I've done this the last couple <laughs> weeks. And uh, so if you get it wrong, you'll tell me yours. If you get it right, I'll tell you mine. But most likely we'll just tell each other um, and I will choose different ones than I used last week mm. because I, I did talk about how. Uh, magic square and color match are both my and you and i've had lengthy discussions about these i think as the one of the first person who did a coloring matching type of uh effect on air <laughs> you I did a you. color match on what on on america's AGT got or, talent yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh you've probably seen many of them go poorly yes yeah i yeah. mean it's again it's easy to do mentalism poorly, the, but it's the thing about color match. And I said this last week is that I can't complain about it on this podcast without talking about methods. So I really just can't like, you know, it's a conversation you and I can have and maybe we can have it after we stop recording and we can l- let that be available to people on Patreon. Um, but I think I think the thing, too, is like you're thinking of one specific take on it, but it just seems like anything with matching uh, things up well, isn't as impressive to you. No, that's that's not what it is um, at all. It, it, okay. Color match is a very specific thing that has to do with the plot, and I would love if someone figured a way around it. With now with with uh, Magic Square, as I talked about last week, it's because I can't add quickly, and the performer is always adding quicker than I am, and so I just end up taking their word for it that all these things add up to be the right answer. Okay, but none of this matters. Well, I want to hear what you're interested in talking about. And I do have a new most favorite and least favorite for this week. So here's your question. Theagenes of Thesos was a boxer, a wrestler and pancreationist, which mean he competed in pancreation. It was an MMA type sport with very few rules. Everything was permitted except gouging the eyes, attacking the genitals and what other thing? Um, attacking your pancreas, clearly. <laughs> pancreas, yes. Yeah. No punching Removing of the pancreas. your pancreas. <laughs> <laughs> no waking up in a bathtub full of ice and with a missing pancreas. Okay, here are your three options. <laughs> this one, one of these things was, was outlawed in pancreation. A, kicking. B, biting. Or C, yelling. Right? Why would they... Why would they ban yelling? That seems like it's part of would be part of it. That seems so out of left field. Um, biting seems like a rule that makes sense today, but if anything goes, I'm sure they allowed biting. Uh, and kicking seems like it's that's probably very important if it's MMM MMA style. Um, 
I don't know. Yelling sounds weird. Let's do yelling. The answer is biting. Be biting. Uh. Yelling was put in there as the, the red herring to, to pull your attention. Uh, biting is is the one. They were not allowed to bite or attack the yeah. genitals that or makes gouge sense. the eyes. But they were allowed to yell as much as they want. Uh, so, all right. What's your most favorite plot in magic? Favorite plot? Yeah. That's most just... favorite. Or in know, mentalism. Like... In, in performing in, in the mystery arts. Yeah, I, I mean, just even just like a simple thought reveal is pretty, I think, very one of my favorites. It's what I do for a living, so, so I'm not going to say. But is there a particular uh, plot, you know, when, when I, I guess what I mean is like, um, you know, a written, you do drawing duplication. You also just do drawing reading, you know. I am the worst to ask these types of questions to Michael because they're all context related to me. Like, I, know, but I, just I, love, I, I love asking these generalizations to people because <laughs> I love categorizing things. I don't know if I can because it's I've seen certain plots that are good in certain hands and some that aren't okay. that are all context. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm trying to punt this as best I can. <laughs> I'm not letting you. <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah. Well, if you if you don't want to say your most favorite plot, you can say your most favorite magician. But that means you also have to tell me your least favorite magician, which you know <laughs> it's gonna suck. So <laughs> it's your choice. Uh, my most favorite plot. I want. Well, you, you, I think just you a answered it. Regular, the right? th- regular thought reading. I don't okay. know. Just any any type of uh, you know, seeing Bob Cassidy do uh, his that old his plot envelope. mind reading. Yeah. <laughs> what a specific plot you named. I mean, uh, you know, seeing Cassidy do his three envelope test that I do as an homage to him is, okay. you know, is the basis of a lot of a uh, lot of why I got into what I do. Okay, awesome, awesome. What yeah. about least? Least? Do you have a least favorite plot? Um, what are you working on currently? <laughs> <laughs> nothing. <laughs> the answer is nothing. The last, um, no, it's been it, it's almost exactly one year since I put anything new in my show. Um, oh, there you go. Yeah, I put a new, I put a, I put a, a chop cup routine in the show last year. Nice. Um, I've never been huge into the linking rings. Uh, that's what Peter said last week. Yeah, I don't know. It just seems like a strange prop. I mean, I've seen it done really well. Yeah. But and what Peter mentioned is like once you link them and unlink them, it has nowhere to go. It's just going to be doing the same thing over and over after that. Yeah. So I read Peter's mind yeah. from oh, last episode. And that was your most favorite, which was a simple mind reading. <laughs> exactly. Um, that's it all amazing. ties together. That's amazing. And that's only that was I put that went up on Patreon today. And, and you're not a member of my Patreon. So there's no way you knew that. This is incredible, ladies and gentlemen. Eric Diddleman has performed for us for free this evening. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. He, you know, we talked about how how, like I said, it's, you know, once you do it, it's done. And I had that similar issue when I did a cut and restored rope routine and the, the cut and restored rope routine that I used to do, the original routine would be that you cut the rope, you tie it together, you slide the knot to a different part of the rope, you untie it, you tie it together, you slide the knot to a different part of the rope and you do that like two more times. And I never performed it that way because like once you do it the first time, it's done. Like they know you can do it. And that'll get applause, but nothing after that's that impressive. Once you've proven that you can do it, why are you still doing it? Well, I mean, in mind reading, you read a mind and then you just do other variations that, that hopefully is a, escalate. That is right? an interesting thought, right? Like, how do you get around that challenge? I mean, you have to do, you know, 45 minutes to an hour of reading minds. and You have to do it in all kinds of different ways. And there's only two things. Yeah, because I do that and I like either by, you know, um, getting information or like people reading or whatever method that's one way or predicting which is really influencing people sure. so there's only really two effects i do but it's just variations of it and uh but you but like even if you know what someone's gonna do like we know what gadgets james bond has before he uses them the fun part is how he's using them in the context yeah um yeah. but i'll be more specific than peter when it comes to the linking ring because <laughs> The part of the linking ring routine that I le- like the least is when they, after they do the linking, and then it's the, let me show you the fun formations I can make out of rings. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's like Cat's Cradle with rings. Yeah. yeah I know. I don't mean. know why that's there or magical. Like, if I want to see a shadow puppet show, Ooh, that would fit in the there. Goes, but um, Ooh, he made a flower. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's that. just a different art form of, like, creating 
structures out of things. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it, it's that's an interesting point. So for me, my least favorite this week, um, most escapes is what I wrote down. Oh. Now, I've been entertained by escapes, but mm-hmm. most escapes um, are set up so that it's it's not as entertaining that they escape than if they didn't escape. And mm. this may be a product of our mod- like modern society, like after we've had jackass and um, fail videos on the Internet and all this type of thing. It might be more entertaining now to see people get hurt than it used to be. Possibly. Right. Right. But I know that for me, um, I do one escape in my show. I have 100 feet of rope. Two people get to tie me up uh, from the audience with that 100 feet of rope. And if I don't escape within two minutes, uh, the guy that I've that I've been picking on throughout the show, he has updated my Facebook page and he gets to post that to my Facebook, whatever he wants, if I don't escape. And the problem is I escape. And he doesn't. But everyone to, wants to see everyone the wants anyway. to see it. So I still post it every time anyway, because that like it, if I don't, it's like the, the least exciting of the two things happened. Right, and I think that's right. the issue with like, you know, the person's going to escape and like, it'd be more entertaining if they didn't. Like if you were Michael Scott missing the brass key and just kind of, you know, in the, in the, um, the straight jacket and couldn't get out, that'd be more entertaining. Um, one of my most favorite things that I thought of this week is just the idea of a confabulation routine. And for non-magicians, confabulations are when a lot of different things happen in the show. It is a, a it's a mentalist type plot. Um, so you just th- said you don't like mentalism. <laughs> well, I guess I've redeemed myself with this one. Um, I just I like the idea. The reason I, and I uh, so I, I didn't finish my my e- explanation of this. A lot of different things happen throughout the show. And then there's one prediction at the end, usually at the end of the show that brings in a lot of different f- pieces of information. And it's not always throughout the show. You know, David Copperfield did one called the graffiti wall where it was different things that people had different information that people had given him that he sprayed on a graffiti wall. And then it was a prediction of all of these things. And the reason I like it is because it can be used as a thing that really ties a show together. And I think that's always really nice is that um, you can take different, you know, pieces of the show that happen at different times and really use it as a really strong closer. So it seems like you like it mostly just because it's a structural thing. Then absolutely, a, uh, absolutely for the, for the show, a form rather than the prediction itself. It's interesting that you point that out because I think a lot of how I feel about magic, whether I like it or don't, has a lot to do with that. Um, structurally, well, that's what I was saying about context matters. It about the does. <laughs> yeah, I think confabulation has sort of a built-in context. Like it's hard to take a confab perform a confabulation where it's there is no context. In fact, I would argue one of the weakest types of uses of those would be like what Copperfield did in the 80s with the graffiti wall, where it is its own vignette versus something that's strung out throughout the entire show. You heard it here. Michael doesn't think if David Copperfield's good at magic. This is uh, my diss track. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what I said. So the problem with David Copperfield, <laughs> the most successful magician in the world... He sucks because of something. <laughs> uh, Interesting. You know, like there was a time when people talked about David Copperfield the way that they talk about like Chris Angel and stuff now. When I was growing up, like magicians would say, uh, Copperfield's a blub. He can only do those big tricks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like people yeah. would, whoever the guy uh, on top is, there are always going to be people knocking on him. Yeah. How much is that? Just jealousy, though. Right? A lot of it. I think yeah, a lot yeah. of it. I would say even a lot of the stuff with Chris Angel is jealousy. Um, you know, a lot of it's not, but a lot of it is. (laughs) All right, man, we're doing well. You're, uh, you're, you're one for four. (laughs) Okay, great. You've gotten all five. That's what you call doing well. You were, you were on the all fiver club, I believe. Um, I think I am. So I'm not stressing about, you know, you'll be asked back again, I I bet. Um, but this (laughs) one will determine that because this last question, question five is for all the marbles. If you get this wrong. Never asking you back on this podcast again. We both know that that's a lie. Uh, I mean, ha- judging how this one went, maybe I'll just <laughs> tank this question to be sure. Here's your here is your question. You were recently, as we discussed, on the cover of MUM magazine. How has oh. your life changed since yes. that? Yes. 
Uh, I got a lot of weeks. likes on the social media posts I did about it. And I have a box of copies of the magazine now that I have to figure out what to do. And uh, and right. a Patreon incentive. And a Patreon. Yeah, well, it's it's you can go and just see it as a public post. Oh, okay. Patreon, so. It's an incentive to visit the Patreon. and uh, Exactly. It's a free trial, sort of. Thing. And maybe you'll uh, check out the Mind Over Magic podcast while you're there. And uh, if you like and want to support it, you can become a patron and get lots of perks there. Well, there you go. There's a plug for for Matt and uh, Eric's uh, OnlyFans on the, uh, the OnlyFans. Oh, I'm sorry, oh, Patreon. No. Patreon. Patreon. Yeah, Same yeah, thing. yeah. Uh, <laughs> that is a correct answer, and I'll be happy to have Woo! you back on the podcast again. Uh, you can see where Eric is performing on his website, which is ericdittleman.com. That's D-I-T-T-E-L, spelled E-L. Um, did 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 yeah. tell? Yeah, yeah. Don't just Eric Diddle won't lead you anywhere. Although if you try to spell it wrong, odds are you'll still get to my website. I did buy a lot of versions of the spelling. <laughs> Smart man. Smart man. Well, it was awesome talking to you, man. Good seeing you, buddy. Good luck on the road. Thank you. You too. Well, that is all for this week. Thank you so much to my friend Eric Dittleman for being my guest. Here's a kid who has never seen the movie Grease. Thank you for listening to The Internet Says It's True. To listen to episodes at free and a week early, support us on Patreon. You can do that at patreon.com forward slash Michael Kent. If you learned something just now that you didn't already know, go to the Apple Podcast app and leave us a review with five stars and a few words. That helps us a ton because that's how the algorithm works. I don't know what an algorithm is, but just do it. See you next week for a brand new episode of The Internet Says It's True! The Internet Says It's True would like to thank the Patreon subscribers whose monthly contributions help to make this show possible. Dallas Ray, Sean Brown, Bryce Swanson, Eugene Anderson, Matt McVeigh, Jim Martin, Joanne Martin, and the show's official Emperor Kick Track. The show is written and produced by me, Michael Kent. The theme song is by Finite Music Forge. All audio clips in this episode are used for education and commentary and used under Fair Use Title 17, USC Section 107. You can listen to past episodes by searching for The Internet Says It's True wherever you get your podcasts, and you can see bonus content at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. 